This video is going to evaluate the cognitive approach in psychology. We will be discussing the strengths and limitations of the cognitive approach that will include supporting evidence, debates and practical applications to help you write some high quality evaluation. Let's dive in. For the cognitive approach, the main idea is on how internal mental processes are involved in our behaviour. One of the key features of the cognitive approach is theoretical models, such as the multi-star model of memory that we explored in the previous video. There's lots of research into our cognitive mental processes and the theoretical models, which we will consider now. For example, Jacobs in 1887 conducted laboratory experiments into short-term memory. Participants were presented with a digit span task, which required them to repeat back a series of numbers or letters, with the length of the numbers or letters increasing by one each time. Jacobs found that on average the capacity of short-term memory in his participants for letters was 7.3 and for numbers 9.3. Miller in 1956, in summarising the research into the capacity of memory, proposed the magic number 7 suggesting that the capacity of short-term memory is 7 plus or minus 2. Therefore, this research demonstrates how internal mental processes such as the capacity of our short-term memory can be scientifically studied and measured. If you wanted to see what the capacity of your memory is, check out the video on the cognitive approach. Maybe you can score higher than 7. Other supporting research comes not from laboratory experiments, but from case studies. Case studies are an in-depth analysis of an individual or a small group of people. One of the most famous and studied individuals in the history of psychology was a man known by many a psychology student around the world as patient H.M. The case study of H.M. provides further support for the theoretical model known as the multi-star model. The multi-star model proposes that there are separate stores for three different types of memory, sensory memory, short-term memory and long-term term memory and that information goes through each of these stores in a linear ordered process. During his childhood HM had been involved in a bicycle accident which resulted in HM developing epilepsy. Many of the seizures he experienced worsened to the point where medication was having little impact and left him with the option of surgery. However, when HM had specific parts of his brain removed, whilst it helped reduce his seizures, it left him with problems with his memory. In short, HM was unable to form any new long-term memories. He could remember things before the surgery, but couldn't form memories after the surgery. So he could have a conversation with you and eat a nice meal, but then later when asked whether he'd met you or what food he'd eaten, he wouldn't remember. His short-term memory was fine, but he couldn't transfer any of this information to long-term memory. The case study of HM helped provide supporting evidence for the cognitive approach, specifically in terms of theoretical models, such as the multi-star model, as it showed that there are separate stores for short and long-term memory. From the evidence we have just considered, you can see that the cognitive approach uses a variety of research methods to study human behaviour. For example, the research of Jacobs in 1887 was a lab-based experiment, and the research into patient HM reflects a case study method. As a result, the cognitive approach can be praised for its use of laboratory experiments. This is because there is a high degree of control over variables, which means that cause and effect can be established. Additionally, the high control allows for the standardisation of procedures, which simply means the way the study is conducted is kept the same each time. This matters because it enables research into mental processes to be replicated to check the reliability of the findings. Therefore, this adds credibility to the cognitive approach's explanation of human behaviour because it's based on highly scientific evidence. However, the cognitive approach has often been criticised because of the artificial tasks often used in their lab experiments. This is because in trying to study memory in a way that is measurable and controlled, it means that the tasks participants are given are often very different from how our memory typically functions. For example, Jacob's use of a random series of numbers that increased in length by one each time is not a task you or I ever really have to do. This is a problem because it limits the extent to which the findings from such research can be generalised beyond the laboratory setting. 
Perhaps in real life, the capacity of our short memory could be longer than the magic number seven Miller suggested, particularly when it comes to more personal and important information. Therefore, the cognitive approach's explanation of human behavior could be questioned because it's based on research that lacks ecological validity. Furthermore, the cognitive approach's use of case studies to study human behavior can also be criticized. This is because case studies are by definition an investigation into individual people which means that the findings from such people may not apply to the wider population. For example, HM's epilepsy and seizures followed by brain surgery and the subsequent impact on his memory is a very rare and unusual set of circumstances and not typical of your average person on the street. Therefore, it could be argued that the cognitive approach's explanation for human behavior may be limited, particularly if the evidence is based on individual cases like HM, which are hard to generalize to others. Another area of evaluation relates to the extent to which the approaches can be practically applied to real world situations. In the case of the cognitive approach, there are many ways in which their ideas and research have been practically applied to make a real difference in the world. One practical application is to do with the cognitive interview. We've explored in the previous video the negative impact that schemas can have by distorting our interpretation of the world. Recall of events happens not by simply replaying the memory like a video in your mind, but instead the memory is reconstructed in our minds and during this piecing together of information, sometimes they are influenced by our schemas, our expectations of events. For example, if someone asked you to recall your seventh birthday, you may say that there were balloons, friends came over, and there was definitely a trip to the swimming pool, and of course, some cake. But it could be that for as long as you can remember, birthdays always involve cake. But on your seventh birthday, for some inexplicable and totally unacceptable reason, there was no cake. But your schemas inserted that detail into the memory because that is what you would expect to be there. This is very important when it comes to eyewitness testimony, where there is the danger of inaccurate and unreliable information being provided when they are interviewed by police because their memories could have been influenced by their beliefs and expectations of what happened by their schemas. To reduce this, research by cognitive psychologists has led to the development of what is called the cognitive interview. This involves a number of techniques that are designed to gather more accurate and reliable information which try to prevent the negative influence of schemas. One of these techniques involves changing the order in which the event is recalled, for example by starting with the last thing that happened and working back to the beginning. This often makes it harder for the eyewitness to reconstruct a story of events based on their schemas and be more likely to report what actually happened. Therefore, this demonstrates how the cognitive approach's understanding of mental processes, like schemas, helps the police record more accurate eyewitness testimony. Secondly, the development of cognitive neuroscience has led to some helpful practical applications. Brain scanning technology has enabled researchers to identify specific parts of the brain involved in specific mental processes. For example, the location of different types of memory have been identified in the brain, which can then be useful in terms of identifying and specifically diagnosing individuals with memory problems, which then can inform how best to treat and support those people. Our third and final practical application of the cognitive approach can be seen in treating depression. Cognitive behavioral therapy, often referred to as CBT, assumes that those suffering with depression often have faulty thinking, which affects the way they feel and behave. CBT focuses on challenging these irrational thoughts that sufferers of depression may have and turning these into more rational, logical thoughts. These are then combined with a coping strategy to help people improve. The effectiveness of this treatment can be seen in how commonly it is used as a treatment on the NHS to help people with depression. For more on CBT and treating depression, if that's something you're interested in, you can also check out this video up here, which explores that in more detail. All of these different examples, whether it's the cognitive interview with the police, the practical applications of cognitive neuroscience, or the treatments for depression with CBT, clearly show that the cognitive approach has made a significant contribution to our understanding of human behavior in the real world.
Next, we can evaluate the cognitive approach by considering the debates in psychology, in particular, the holism and reductionism debate. The holism and reductionism debate is about what is the best way to explain behaviour. To what extent should we explain behaviour by reducing or breaking down behaviour to its simplest component parts? Or should we explain human behaviour as a whole? One of the main criticisms of the cognitive approach is that it is reductionist. This is because with its emphasis on computer models and information processing, their view of the human mind can often be described as mechanical and machine-like. This is a problem because much of human behaviour and thought is unlike the logical, linear process of a computer. Humans can be irrational and unpredictable at times. And additionally, much of human behaviour and thought can be shaped by emotions. We'll eat our dinner right after you! For example, research has shown how emotions such as anxiety and fear can affect your recall of events, particularly as an eyewitness to a crime. By breaking behaviour down to a set of computer processes, it could be argued that it loses what it means to be human. Therefore, it calls into question the extent to which the cognitive approach is fully accounting for and explaining human behaviour. Finally, we can evaluate the cognitive approach through comparing it with other approaches. The behaviourist approach with the work of B.F. Skinner would argue that only directly observable behaviour can be studied scientifically and therefore would criticise the cognitive approach's way of studying the mind through inferences. For behaviourists, inferences are not a truly objective study of the mind because we cannot know for certain that what they infer is going on in the mind is actually what is going on in the mind because we cannot directly observe it it could be wrong. Therefore, it could be argued that on this point, the behaviourist approach is superior because of its stronger focus on the scientific process. On the other hand, we could argue that in another area, the cognitive approach's way of studying behaviour is better than the behaviourist approach. This is because the research conducted by behaviourists Ivan Pavlov and B.F. Skinner were conducted on animals. As such, the behaviourist approach is criticised in terms of how generalisable the findings from animals can be applied to humans. On the other hand, the cognitive approach does not study animals, particularly because of the cognitive mental processes involved in human behaviour. Therefore, it could be argued that the cognitive approach is more able to generalise the findings of their research than the behaviourist approach. So now that you hopefully understand something of the strengths and limitations of the cognitive approach, bear in mind how you can order and structure your discussion about the approach in an essay. Notice how we've used a variety of evaluation points to use our wider understanding of psychology to evaluate this approach. Now, you certainly don't need or have to write all of these points in an exam, so just pick four of these that you understood the best. For more on the other approaches in psychology, check out the links to the playlist in the description below. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.